Hello my dear friends welcome to the session 2 or part 2 of pulmonary hypertension series today we are going to talk about a diagnostic test for pulmonary hypertension which is the gold standard in diagnostic testing and today that is right heart catheterization so right heart catheterization we know is is the gold standard which is taken into consideration and all the measurements which define pulmonary hypertension are taken into account based on ideally right heart cath readings now i understand as a clinician we all think that we will not be able to get a right heart cath done for all of our patients so how do we go about it so we do use additional information from 2d echo from uh, digital subtraction angiography and other modes and methods to uh, see if we suspect a patient to have ph but uh, definitely if we want a conclusive evidence then right heart cath is important uh, not only for diagnosing but also following up this patient so right heart cath basically involves catheterization of the right side of the heart and it is more like um, it's it's actually like the central venous catheter that you place uh, the methodology the site uh, the difference is that you can also access it like a pick line so you can also access it through the basilic vein so you can either access it through the internal jugular or basilic vein and put a catheter in the right heart and wedge it in the pulmonary artery and that's the basic technique how it goes about the goal is basically to measure the pressure waves to assess these pressure waves as they keep changing as they are generated by the different cardiac chambers so that way we are able to estimate a change in the pressure and thus give the readings so technique as i said is most mostly like the central line placement so a pulmonary artery catheter called the swan gons catheter uh, is introduced and this is a 5 to 7 french catheter and um, unlike your central line it contains two to five lumen and each lumen has a different purpose so there is a lumen which will help in inflation of the balloon there's a lumen which will help in distilling uh, fluids extracting blood uh, and pacing so this is how it looks like the swan guns catheter uh, usually we give a local anesthetic we prefer the jugular or the subclavian site as compared to the femoral site uh, the brachial or the subclavian vein uh, basilic vein or the subclavian vein can also be used and you puncture it the guide wire is introduced through seldinger technique the sheath is introduced and once you have the access the catheter is left indwelling so either the jugular or the subclavian vein is preferable because then the patient can also be mobile and you can use it further as your central line and the jugular approach is preferred to the subclavian approach because there's lesser risk of pneumothorax and it's easily performed you can do it under sono guidance and um, once we do that so each of the ports can be used so if you look from left to right there's a port for thermistor connection for pressures there's a medication portal there's a proximal injection hub a distal injection hub and a balloon inflation valve and a syringe that can be used after the sheath is uh, placed and the catheter has been flushed it is then advanced into the heart into the inferior vena cava superior vena cava right atrium ventricle and then the pulmonary artery so if you look at the placement of the normal uh, how we introduce it so initially the uh, pulmonary artery catheter is placed in the right atrium aiming at the lateral wall now once it's rotated counterclockwise the catheter is aimed posteriorly and then it is allowed to be placed and advanced into the superior vena cava once the superior vena cava has been reached the catheter is again withdrawn back into the right atrium and once it's uh, done that then it is aimed laterally you rotate it clockwise and the tip crosses the tricuspid valve now the tip in horizontal position this tip is positioned below the right ventricular outflow tract and then again a clockwise rotation causes the catheter to point straight up and is advanced into the pulmonary artery and from there the wedge pressures can be estimated so this is how it is done
and um, the waveforms and the pressures can be assessed. So uh, coming to the waveforms now, so when the catheter is first in the right atrium, you get the right atrial waveform and the right atrial pressure normally is 0 to 8. So we can see if there's any change in the right atrial pressure. Once it's advanced into the right ventricle, this is a normal right ventricular waveform. The systolic pressure being 20 to 30, diastolic 0 to 8. Again, if it's increased, we'll see the changes. Then pulmonary artery pressure. And then finally, the pulmonary artery wedge pressure can be assessed. So looking at the individual waveforms, uh, the right atrial waveforms are small amplitude and uh, you remember the ACXVY with the AC and V positive and the X and Y descends as a typical right atrial waveform which represent atrial systole, atrial relaxation, here the closure of the tricuspid valve, ventricular systole or atrial diastole and the passive filling of the right ventricle. So by looking at these waveforms and by estimating the pressure, we can estimate what are the changes to the right atrium. These are examples of elevated V waves and prominent Y descent which happens in a case with tricuspid regurgitation and this is an example of a prominent Y descent in a right atrial waveform which is not normal and um, here as well and these are usually seen in patients with tamponade or constrictive pericarditis or cardiomyopathies. So remember the normal RA pressure is around 6 millimeters of mercury mean being 3 more the pressure in the right atrium there are uh, it could be because of pulmonary hypertension it could be because of shunts left to right tricuspid regurgitation tamponade and if there is an abnormal a wave or an abnormal y descent or an absent a wave they can help us clinch the diagnosis so um, an elevated a wave such as in tricuspid stenosis or when the ventricular compliance is low or the uh, valve is stenosed and an absent a wave is as an atrial fibrillation or a sawtooth wave as an atrial flutter similarly if you look at the right ventricular pressures then the normal right ventricular pressure being 25 and 4 if there are changes because of um, an elevated end diastolic pressure or because of a dip and plateau as in constrictive pericarditis or a, f or a faster upstroke, a higher RV pressure in pulmonary hypertension or valvular diseases, then they are looked into by looking at the pressures here. And in pulmonary artery, uh, we would again want to look at the abnormal pulmonary artery waveforms. We want to look at the morphology of the wave, uh, an elevated systolic pressure as in idiopathic pulmonary hypertension or hypoxemia related pulmonary hypertension or uh, left to right shunts and um, sometimes reduced pulse pressure as in right ventricular ischemia or infarction or in a pulmonary embolism. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure again normally when there is no obstruction between the left atrium and the left ventricle the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure correlates with the left atrial pressure or the left ventricular and diastolic pressure um, if you want a true wedge pressure then only when there is no flow you will be able to get the pressure so if the vessel is closed for flow by a balloon by occluding it then you will be able to estimate this pressure so um, so this pressure is measured by wedging the uh, pulmonary artery catheter the swan catheter into the smaller pulmonary arterial branches and they are a surrogate for the left atrial pressures and the left ventricular and diastolic pressures so this way uh, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure can be estimated which definitely increases when there's pulmonary embolism or veno occlusive disease or uh, any obstruction in the left atrium or mitral stenosis uh, then these pressures can go up as far as the pulmonary vascular resistance, the term PVR is concerned. It's important to remember it's the gold standard when we estimate pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension as we uh, discussed in the previous uh, series talk. And it reflects the pressure drop across only the pulmonary system. So when we are talking about only pulmonary system, pulmonary vascular resistance is a better uh, measurement than pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And if it is increased, then we can say that it reflects pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension and so in pulmonary venous hypertension, 
it can be increased this is a beautiful sheet and i think something that um, is a revision of what all we've discussed it's an interpretation cheat sheet things like this can be kept handy for reference uh, remember there are a lot of direct measurements but also a lot of indirect measurements that are taken out out of these values so um, so it looks quite complex but uh, using such sheets we can easily uh, remember and correlate our waveform so i advise you take a screenshot and this can come handy so what is vasoreactivity testing now we've all heard about vasoreactivity testing and it's important because it determines the treatment of the patient so we're going to discuss a little bit about it now when we are talking about uh, patients with group 2 or post capillary pulmonary hypertension now in these these patients usually when you when you're looking at pre-capillary versus post-capillary pulmonary hypertension we discussed that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure can help us distinguish because if it's less than 15 it usually correlates with pre-capillary and more than 15 is post-capillary so in such cases now in in certain cases where uh, there may also be mixed pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension once we do vasoreactivity testing we can actually uh, understand and determine if our patients respond to treatment with high dose calcium channel blockers so patients who usually have an idiopathic pulmonary hypertension or the heritable or genetic variant or drug induced pulmonary hypertension uh, in those patients calcium channel blockers are usually uh, recommended because it, it is the idiopathic or the drug induced pH these groups the group 1 pH where they have evidence of improved survival on using calcium blockers in all other forms of pulmonary hypertension and uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension and this includes the chronic lung diseases the response may be inadequate so this drug is not indicated so vasoreactivity testing is very important because it distinguishes whether the treatment would be needed or not needed so during testing what we do is the patient is given pure oxygen for around five minutes now once the patient is given oxygen if the pulmonary artery pressures as measured by the um, the swan gons catheter if the pressures start normalizing with supplemental oxygen alone it indicates that the vasoconstriction is because of hypoxemia and if it's because of hypoxemia then further vasoreactive testing is not needed because this patient uh, just needs oxygen he doesn't need a calcium blocker if your patient does not respond to the oxygen then one proceeds ahead and does the acute vasoreactivity testing now there are various um, ways of doing it and in in america is the use of inhaled nitric oxide iv adenosine and iv epoprostenol is used for testing but the european guidelines vary and they also recognize inhaled iloprost uh, as i said the contraindications are usually the group 2 ph so group 1 it's better it's to be done and patients with significant lv failure it's also contraindicated if patient has severe hypertension and it's also contraindicated when you suspect a venoclusive disease so the consensus the american consensus is that you give inhaled nitric oxide as the preferred agent because it has less side effects and a shorter half life and um, with the help of respiratory therapists you give 40 parts per million of nitric oxide and 100 percent oxygen now make the hemodynamic measurements at baseline check them after 5 to 10 minutes of inhaled nitric oxide or if you're using epoprostenol you infuse it at 2 nanogram per kg per minute and you keep increasing it by the same amount every 10 to 15 minutes till a dose of 12. so how do we define a positive test a positive acute response is defined by a reduction in mean pap by 10 to 40 millimeters of hg and the cardiac output either stays unchanged or is increased in patients who have a left heart disease vasoreactivity testing we restrict only to patients when we are evaluating them for a heart transplant or in the context of other shunts so normally otherwise the indication mainly lies in group 1 ph for performing so recommended drugs with the route of administration is given in this table and as i said there's a lot of variability but commonly nitric oxide is something that is universally accepted along with iloprost and epoprostenol nowadays
So this slide uh, summarizes the main variables that are measured and the main variables that are calculated after right heart cath and again it's screenshot worthy and you can save it for future reference. Another form of uh, right heart catheterization testing is exercise right heart catheterization. This is a very interesting and unique concept and uh, though right heart catheterization in itself is the gold standard method to assess cardiopulmonary hemodynamics but sometimes we do need to see these hemodynamics while the patient is exercising and that is how we define exercise induced pulmonary hypertension. So basically uh, for all patients who have unexplained dyspnea, normal testing, haven't been able to figure out the cause, they have desaturation on exercise and resting hemodynamics are fine in those patients to detect an early uh, pulmonary vascular disease or a left heart dysfunction we could perform an exercise right heart cath and this can also be done along with cardiopulmonary exercise testing and um, usually it is not associated with any additional risk factors as compared to a resting right heart cath and can be done in the right setup normally incremental exercise protocols are used step up protocol or ramp protocols and hemodynamic measurements are repeated and these provide the clinical information. We need basically few uh, predominant hemodynamic variables at each exercise level which include the mean PAP, the systolic PAP, diastolic PAP, wedge pressure, cardiac output, heart rate and blood pressures but then the saturation, the central venous oxygenation, they are also measured. The final conclusions uh, after calculations, cardiac index, the total pulmonary resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance, all this is also calculated at exercise level and at different oxygen requirements. And these uh, variables can help us diagnose exercise induced pH. Normally, a pulmonary artery wedge pressure cutoff of 25 during supine exercise is recommended for diagnosing um, preserved ejection fraction heart failures and in patients with lung diseases because the intrathoracic pressure also causes a rise in mean pap so usually uh, when patient performs exercise this exaggerates and we may see a rise in right atrial pressures in these patients as well a lot of exercise hemodynamics are age dependent so there's a difference between healthy elderly subjects and young adults and these differences have to be kept in mind but to diagnose early disease this may be a very useful test to perform. This is an illustration how supine exercise testing can be done and um, we can see differences and uh, normally after nitric oxide is given uh, the RV afterload reduces, we may see uh, an increased preload when we are giving a fluid bolus, uh, when the patient is exercising the contractility should increase and uh, we'll we are able to ascertain the cause of pulmonary hypertension in such cases. Another form of testing that is done is by giving a fluid challenge. This is usually done to classify the cause of pH and for hemodynamic assessment before transplants or cardiac shunts. So again, uh, this can be performed in the right setting, but the main contraindications is that you must ensure that your patient is hemodynamically stable, he doesn't have a recently placed clip or a heart mechanical heart valve or a pacemaker and pre-existing conditions have to be optimized because you do not want the patient to go into a direct overload. I leave you with two tables that are taken from the guidelines. One is for uh, the recommendations for right heart cath and the vasoreactivity testing with their level of evidence and uh, how we choose which patient to perform which test and this is a very good algorithm a diagnostic algorithm with unexplained dyspnea where after you've ruled out the history you've done the ecgs the sats you suspect a lung cause you do you do the cardiac lung related test and if you are not able to find out a cause you have a probability of pulmonary hypertension you go ahead and perform the invasive assessment if needed and um, so these tables can be helpful in forming these flowcharts can help us in guided 
decisions uh, that's all for today folks and um, i dedicated the whole uh, talk to right heart catheterization because um, i remember as a student myself uh, this area is a very gray area we don't read too much in detail about it but there are few aspects that we must know as pulmonologists so i'll join you for another video hopefully sooner uh, on the treatment guidelines for pulmonary hypertension Thank you and happy reading.